standing at Subtech, aren't you? <laughs> Smile. <laughs> Got two seconds. One. <laughs> it actually makes it a lot more fun. <laughs> Okay, probably time for us to uh, start. I thought uh, what we do for this is just have you speak. <laughs> now it's time to start. Okay. Uh, this is a presentation on some work that uh, Jerry Williams and I, from uh, both at Brigham Young University, have been. It's an outgrowth of some work we've been doing for the last four or five years trying to figure out how to teach our respective skills courses. 
which is, uh, if you teach in that area, is always a mystery, and uh, hopefully an evolving one toward uh, some clarity. And so we've been doing a lot of work uh, researching uh, recent uh, findings in, uh, uh, in cognitive science about how expertise is acquired, the acquisition of professional expertise, so, uh, uh, familiarizing ourselves in greater depth with certain learning theories, and then trying to apply them in our skills courses, which ultimately led us to a, a significant problem that I'll get to in a minute. And, the, and this presentation is about our solution to what we saw as a critical problem in that whole process. So the web camera is just to let you know that uh, at least we've learned how to hook them up. <laughs> and take a picture or two uh, with it. Uh, but for now, I'll turn the thing off and we'll, uh, we'll talk. Okay, there are really two titles for this. Using web cameras to record student performance. That's what uh, we are basically about uh, in this session. But the, the subtext and the context for all of that is increasing effectiveness of deliberate and reflective practice in our effort uh, to teach uh, these classes, uh, interviewing and counseling and legal negotiation. So what I'd like to do first is, uh, I'll do first, is give you some uh, context, some background about how we, have, uh, we conceptualize what we're doing, the theory that underlies our efforts, and then uh, Jerry Williams will uh, demonstrate for you his implementation of these ideas in his legal negotiation class. Uh, we, uh, I have also implemented them in my interview and counseling class, but as we've gone over the context of this, uh, we're, we're not going to have time to d discuss two, so we'll, we'll take the better one, uh, <laughs> the better implementation. Okay, you also have to forgive me, I'm trying this tablet PC I spoke about the other day, and who knows what's going to happen in the context of of doing this. Okay, let's start then with talking about uh, patterns of the uh, of development of uh, expertise or skill development, skill acquisition in complex domains. This is we've been looking at this because uh, we consider legal interviewing and counseling, legal negotiations to be very complex domains with uh, with a subtle set of skills that are necessary to perform effectively in, in delivering legal services. Uh, the first thing that uh, really has struck us about this domain is that recent research has indicated, and actually my own experience has reinforced this uh, quite dramatically, is that there's a plateau effect in skill development, in particularly in professional practice, but in any discipline. And the plateau effect means that when you start in a practice, in the early phases, you're anxious, you're motivated, your people know that you're a novice, they're giving you feedback, you're requesting feedback, you're paying attention to what you're doing, uh, you're, you're overwhelmed by lots of things, but at least you're doing some things to improve skills that you're uncertain about. And so there's a learning curve that, that starts and rises uh, more steeply at the beginning. Uh, as, as you move along, you reach a personally acceptable level of performance. Now, personally acceptable, uh, in my observation, may mean anything from sort of disastrously incompetent to highly competent. It depends, one, on what the person knows about the performance, whether they have any theory or understanding that could lead them to uh, effective performance, or uh, if they know nothing and they, they're getting by and people aren't suing them and the State Bar Association isn't hauling them in for malpractice, then that's acceptable. So it depends on what acceptable means. But for people in general, uh, and so under these conditions, people continue to learn. They improve they, to reach this acceptable level. But here's the, here's the catch. Beyond this point, once they get that comfort level, there's very little improvement, and you really are looking at, uh, in most jobs, most professional activities, a leveling off fairly early in practice of certain kinds of skills. We'll talk in a minute what kinds of skills those are. But what happens is, uh, is this, uh, this leveling off, and it isn't a result of the fact there, there isn't more to learn, that you couldn't be better at what you're doing. It is a result of your personal adaptation and, and the fact that 
you stop doing the things that up front made you, motivated you to evolve your skills in some positive way. Now, this line and this graph represents skill level and months in practice, but that's purely for illustrative purposes. It illustrates sort of the, the collection of data that's, that's current now about uh, professional skill acquisition. But the data here isn't real. It, it, I just want to make sure. Uh, okay, so this plateau effect has to do with early learning, the learning curve, the nature of the learning curve, and it turns out that it's a, a general result, at least the research suggests that it's general. If you're studying a musical instrument, you're going to plateau uh, at some point, uh, except under certain conditions we'll get to in a minute. Uh, if you're learning negotiation skills, interviewing counseling skills, you're going to plateau. Uh, golf, clearly you plateau. <laughs> I see there's a golfer out here. Uh, and legal reasoning. We, but it turns out, if you look at the theory carefully, re legal reasoning capacity has the same uh, plateau effect. Advocacy skills, mediation skills, very broad brush concept. Okay, let me apply it first to interviewing and counseling, just as an illustration. Let's look at some things that I've observed. I've had the occasion over about an eight-year period to observe maybe 800 lawyers interviewing and counseling real clients, just to, uh, through a one-way glass and, and other, not students, practicing lawyers interviewing and counseling clients. Here's what I've observed that is consistent with the theory. Increase of years of practice do not produce a corresponding improvement in interviewing and counseling skills. I've, I've observed the same lawyer, in fact, videotaped the same lawyer, uh, well, videotaped the lawyer 15 years earlier and then observed the lawyer 15 years later. And you, and you could not tell the difference in the, in the lawyer's skill level between the two events. In fact, observed the lawyer, several lawyers several times 15 years later. So, over time, they are into the level part of the curve. And we videotaped them fairly early in their practice, after maybe two, three, four years of practice. So by then, apparently, they were already uh, plateaued. Effective interviewing and counseling skills do not develop automatically with experience. Thus, practicing lawyers have poor to moderate skills, in my, in my observation. doesn't mean there aren't some with excellent skills, and particularly students who have studied interviewing and counseling and are more serious about developing those skills. Interviewing skills plateau quickly and remain relatively static. Let's take a look. Here's the curve again. This is the uh, curve for, you know, the one I threw up earlier, but here's what I've observed more likely to be the case with interviewing counseling skills. Very rapid uh, uh, rise right here in interviewing skill right up front. First times you do it, first through, uh, and it's... I don't have the time to explain it today, but there are some very profound dynamics that affect that, that lock the skills and the pattern in very early in the process. And thereafter, you have basically a level sort of experience going from that. Um, so professional activities, and, and, and the underlying dynamic is basically what's on the screen, but I'll just explain it that interviewing, along with many other professional activities, doesn't allow for feedback. You can't ask your client how you did. Your client isn't going to tell you how, how, you, how you handled the interviewing and counseling, at least most clients. Uh, some assertive and perceptive clients might. But in most contexts, they're not going to tell you. You're not going to get feedback. And if you got the feedback, it wouldn't be very useful. It would be generic, like, I don't like what you're doing, or this isn't very helpful, or... Uh, it, it wouldn't be very precise. It wouldn't be the kind of thing that would ratchet up your skills. It might make you anxious and therefore uh, think about what you might do differently. So the plateau effect, at least in this context, takes a different, slightly different form but has the same underlying dynamic. That is, uh, where you're not getting feedback, you're making decisions, and, and you just get into a habit or a pattern that seems to work with very little understanding of what where you're at actually and where you might arrive at with that skill level. Okay, well, where does that lead us in instruction then? 
What we'd like to do, uh, ideally, and this is true for any skills instructor, is to uh, take this this pattern that, are, that emerges with no skill development, with no instruction, and to change it so that, one, you start with a higher base level of, uh, with your, right here, you're several notches above where you, the student coming into practice should be several notches above where they would be if they hadn't taken the course, if they hadn't studied interviewing counseling or negotiation or mediation, and that you train them so that the curve is steadily upward rather than plateauing. In other words, they have, you, you do two things. One, you give them basic skills, and two, the capacity to learn from their experience and not to simply uh, struggle a bit and then, then plateau. Now, they can still plateau uh, for lack of motivation, but that isn't uh, uh, at least going to be your responsibility uh, I've given up on motivating students <laughs> too far beyond the course, it turns out. Um, so that's the goal of a course, the skills course, is to get that base level up and to provide, at least for us, some uh, ongoing capacity to benefit from experience. Well, uh, there has been a, uh, a, for a long time, the essential formula for doing that has been known. For example, here's something that I took out of a 1979 teacher's manual for a legal interviewing and counseling course. The elements are basically there. Teach them some theory, have step-by-step -step learning, identify sub-skills, work on them separately, uh, use simulations for exp to generate to controlled experiential learning, uh, give observation, reflection, feedback, and then, uh, and then have them practice and, and get feedback, repeat simulations, uh, that sort of thing. What recent research has done is refine those concepts so that you can see, one, what are the essential elements and how do those mix together to be effective in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a course like uh, an interviewing and counseling course. One of those uh, findings has been summarized in the notion of deliberate practice. A deliberate practice takes the following form. Uh, actually, I like it better in this form. <laughs> I think we should teach golf to law students, and then they could learn from that. But uh, golf is a, is a skill set made up of putting, chipping, driving, uh, iron, you know, uh, sand trap, uh, what do you call it? Uh, blasting the ball out of the sand trap, <laughs> uh, irons off the fairway, all kinds of uh, sub-skills, the swing, uh, the putting stroke, and it breaks down into maybe a, an effective golfer has worked on perhaps 500 different sub-skills and, and developed schema for implementing them. Well, deliberate practice, uh, uh, according to the most recent research, takes the following form, which is very similar to what we just saw. Identify a practice task, but the subtext of that is it has to be part of the larger skill set. Precisely define the task and the target goals. In other words, the, the task shouldn't be just any task, and it shouldn't be something you think, well, that would be helpful. It should be well thought out, and it should be at a, an appropriate level of difficulty, and so that the person can actually... Uh, master it well enough to, to uh, ratchet forward their capacity to do the uh, larger task. And then practice the task. Very s intuitive uh, list here. But one of the things they found is it requires enormous concentration to practice effectively. And the way most students practice uh, is, is to, well, gee, there's a, a bit of busy work in this course. I've got to get this out of the way. I, I'll, I'll sort of work through the exercise. I may not... I may or may not even uh, spend time preparing for it. Okay, so practice needs to be systematic, concentrated, and as a result, it's not inherently enjoyable. It's work. It's like practicing the piano that, uh, for some children and or other people learning the piano that aren't entirely motivated. Okay, and then the next step is, the, is a critical one, the reflective analysis of the practice experience. And there's a, a, a literature that started long ago that's evolved, that has really refined the notion of what reflective analysis and, and reflection is. 
that uh, can guide uh, in setting up exercises and, and doing that. One of, the, uh, one of the parts of reflective analysis is this uh, notion of informative feedback. In other words, cap for interviewing counseling, it's capturing the exercise so that it can be reviewed. And, uh, and part of the reason for that is uh, 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 research on brain activity strongly suggests that when you have two things going on at once, they, I mentioned this in the tablet PC presentation the other day, they will interfere with each other. The brain is, is, can handle multiple tasks, but when it gets to multiple cognitive tasks, that there is a, a time-sharing lapse between shifting from one task to the other. So if you're both the observer and the performer, and especially if you're new at both, you're not going to do either well and you're not going to learn as quickly or as efficiently as if you could just be the performer and later be the observer and the analyzer and the reflector. And so one of the problems with simulation or any other kind of experiential learning is that uh, it's, it's inefficient, it can be inefficient if you're trying to do everything at once, both learn and practice. So learning and practice can be, uh, and if you've, if you've ever interviewed a lawyer after they've met with a client and you talk to them about what did you do as an interviewer and a counselor, it's all substantive. They spend no time observing how they, at, at a, the kinds of things that a person uh, interested in interviewing counseling performance would be thinking about or spending time on. How are we doing on time? Sure, I don't. See. Oh, there's a clock. Okay, we're okay. <laughs> In any case, uh, reflective analysis of the practice test. This is the critical step. This is the one that turns out to be the problem that we're trying to address. But so you work through and you uh, and you learn from your experience. You correct it and then you. Uh, oops, I'm in the pen. Sorry. Yeah, I got to go to pen mode there. Oh. <laughs> okay, step four. Uh, modify the practice task and repeat the process. Deliberate practice assumes many repetitions. And that's clear that the brain is a very plastic uh, organ that can learn and grow and develop, but it doesn't do it on the basis of a single repetition. The, the connections are not strong. The networks are not intricate. It takes many repetitions of a, an experience to, to develop a deep understanding, and not just a deep understanding, but a performance level understanding of some task that allows you fluidity in, in performing the task. Okay, that's, that's deliberate practice. The second uh, fundamental theory for this is reflective practice. That's a little easier to present. It, it has to do with a, a self-awareness, an ongoing motivation to pay attention to your professional skills, to know that they're there, that there are skills to learn, and, that, and a willingness to think about them and reflect on your experience. Uh, and, and not to be uh, thin-skinned, not to be willing to be self-critical or to allow others to give you feedback and, uh, and, uh, and evaluation, to do evaluations of your performance. It's also a problem-solving orientation to problematic issues. In other words, you're, not only do you see them, you don't run from them, you don't hide them from them, you don't deny them, you don't uh, 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 say, well, it's not important anyway. What I'm about is the substantive practice of law, and those skills are inconsequential. Uh, but it's an orientation to, I have a problem. I'm going to work on it. I'm going to improve. And, and reflective practice is a combination of a mental set and a willingness to, uh, to really invest in uh, observation of your own behavior and to work toward improving it. So being critical and, and benefiting from that criticalness. So here we have a kind of a refinement of what has been known for a long time. Deliberate practice, reflective practice, things that can be taught, skills that can be learned in their own right. So what's the problem? We now have the literature. We have the understanding. Well, Jerry Williams and I have been doing this uh, with this literature for several years now and, and remain dissatisfied that, uh, one, Here's some problems. Students don't don't take this as seriously as we do sometimes. Uh, some students, perhaps more than we'd like. The other is uh, that it's difficult for them, uh, and it creates logistical problems. Suppose I do an in-class exercise. 
Students pair up, everybody does it. And then I want them to reflect on what happened. Well, we can do that as a group. But then they haven't really reflected on their experience. So we can take time out and have them write about their experience. Take 10, 15 minutes, analyze it, write it, submit that. But then no one else observed their experience. Uh, you know, did they get it right? And it takes a big chunk of class time. And so you're, you cut down on your simulation. They get less experience, more reflection. Uh, some real logistical problems in, in trying to implement this, say, in the classroom. Well, here's, so the problem is right there, step three. It is implementing the reflective part of it. You can do the exercises, you can get them. Uh, well, there's problem with step one, the motivation to do it right, to concentrate, all of those things. But in the end, the logistical hang-up is with step three, reflection, Useful feedback, effective reflection, and, uh, and, and not using up all of your, uh, say, class time for that process. So the essence of the problem, it's difficult and expensive to capture performance in a conveniently reviewable format. And two, it's difficult to distribute captured performances for evaluation and uh, review by participating students, TAs, etc. It's expensive. It takes staff if you're going to get videotaping. It takes uh, logistical coordination to get everybody in there to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, at the right time with the right people. Students don't show up. You have all kinds of problems. Uh, with, with, when you have something that involves so many people, uh, uh, institutional resources, that kind of thing. So to really get the kind of capture and feedback you want, the institution can't afford it at least legal institutions, if you're a clinical psychology training program, they, you have fewer students and more resources per student, and perhaps you can do that kind of thing better. But in a legal education setting, it isn't easy. So the web camera solution. What we've, we've been struggling with how to, to solve that. We thought, well, buy a video camera, buy a whole bunch of video cameras. But video cameras are expensive, they're fragile, they, uh, they take uh, uh, some uh, learning curve of their own to learn to operate and use well. Then you've got to download the video. You've got to convert it, perhaps. Uh, you've, got, you've got to compress it. All things that you're going to require staff and faculty or time and, and uh, TA time to do. And, and in the process of thinking that through, and we're almost to the point where we're willing to do that, uh, we came up with this idea. Well, uh, I'll get... So the idea is web cameras have been designed to bypass all of that, to be inexpensive, not the same quality video, but to be logistically simple and to, uh, and to handle capture and compression and uh, saving the video all in a, simp a relatively simple process that can be uh, understood. Now, before I move into this solution, uh, here's the two preconditions that we thought uh, uh, that are critical, at least for our use, uh, what we're trying to do. One is we have a notebook computer requirement at our law school. Every student comes every year with one of two uh, recommended notebook computers with a certain level of, co of, uh, of, of a certain configuration on them. So we know what technical capacity every student has in every class. So we have a, a, a base level technology that we can draw upon for this. Uh, the other is you need a, a convenient high speed network connection because you'll see in a second why, why that's necessary to this. So our solution is trying to address the reflection problem. And this is what we've come up with. Okay, I'll, I'll walk through this. Uh, the first step first step is to make available web cameras to the students. And what we've applied for a grant, received a grant for an experimental process to buy 40 web cameras at $129 each. Uh, hopefully in, in mass they're a little cheaper than that but sort of top-of-the-line web cameras. And, and they're, they're basically pretty simple devices. That's it. You plug that into a USB 2 port, beginning of the semester you load some software, and you're set to record 
off the web camera and to save video on your notebook computer. No switches, you don't turn them on, you don't turn them off, you don't adjust the focus. You do adjust where it's pointing, but you can do that on your screen. And so students use web cameras to capture their exercises. And every student gets a web camera and points it at themselves when they do an exercise, whether they're in pairs or whatever they're doing. And then they transfer that material to a network drive. So all students in each of these classes have an automatic logon to a network drive where they can upload, they can't delete other students' work, but they can upload and save their own work on the network drive, which is also available to the instructors, TAs, and to the other students in the class. So we get an, in, an immediate sharing uh, of information. Now, if we come back to the problem, motivation, everything you do is now captured, can be reviewed by somebody, and will be reviewed by certainly by yourself, because you no longer, we no longer have to have in-class, for in-class exercise, writing reflections, because they can go home and look at it. The assignment can be, now go review that on your notebook computer at home. Also upload it to the network drive so we can, we can review any exercises we're interested in reviewing. And, uh, and, and on-screen video is much easier to review, much easier to control than, uh, of course, the old video tape recorders and, and other devices that are less flexible. So that's, that's the concept. Get some network space, half a gigabyte, or uh, uh, 500 gigabytes in, the, in our case. We got funding to buy extra hard drives and put on uh, some servers. Get the students connected, use the base level technology. And then when, when they come to class, uh, the audiovisual people simply deliver to the class, if it's an in-class exercise, the web cameras. And when students are ready to pair up, they just grab one, sit down, plug it in. They already have the software. They're ready to record their exercise. Okay, here's a couple of illustrations of uh, some students doing, the exercise, doing an exercise. You can see the, uh, it isn't real clear, but the, the, their images are on the screen. Uh, and it's re each one of them is recording the exercise for themselves. So the one thing, you get redundancy. And it turns out these things have great microphones, absolutely spectacular microphones. They pick up what's near, they screen out what's a little distant, and it's uh, very clear and crisp. Oops. One person, no, you're not, uh, there is some, Jerry's going to talk about that in a minute, but there are problems in a negotiation because they have a narrow field of view and you have to set them back a very long way if you want to get both in and then the video doesn't have quite the same impact. So it, it picks up both conversations, both cameras pick up both conversations. That's right. They pick up both conversations very nicely. Uh, you don't need more microphones, but you probably need more cameras. Each, each person would have a camera. The, the microphones will pick up everything. Okay, now here, uh, some technical and resource advantages. Web camera technology is designed to be relatively simple. All operate with relatively less uh, resource, to be relatively less resource consuming, the standard uh, video. Uh, they're less expensive. Uh, the recordings are done by the students. The, the whole process eliminates the need for uh, much work by AV personnel. Our computer consultants come in at the beginning of the semester to make sure they get all the software installed and that they know how to use this. We have one class partially devoted to working the technology, but it's not complex. It doesn't take a lot of training. Uh, Top-of-the-line web cameras are more than adequate. Uh, the video, when it's close up, is really quite crystal clear, 30 frames per second, nice non-jerky video. And uh, we've, we've done measurements on how much space it takes. Half hour exercise, about half a gigabyte of space, 500, 600 megabytes, which isn't bad, saving it to a 60 gigabyte hard drive and then uploading it to a high speed network connection. Once it hits the network, we can press it, put it back, and anyone that needs to download it then gets a, a 100 megabyte file rather than a 600 megabyte file of the compressed video. Uh, Exercises are automatically coded, uh, so they're convenient for review. Uh, eliminates all the logistical problems. The common uh, is sort of the network idea. Everything's accessible 
from your network connection, and the students all have built-in network connections, high-speed network connections in their carols, all have individual carols and, and automatic uh, connection to the network there. Uh, and then we have convenient access. So the logistics of this work. It, it is very little staff, very little, other than the initial investment in the equipment and the periodic training, uh, you, now, we now have a mechanism for capturing and reviewing and, uh, and having access, and in fact, having a complete record of everything the student did, does through the entire semester. Every exercise they do. My class, they'll do 20 to 24 exercises. Every one of them will have been captured and, uh, and analyzed by the student. Okay. Uh, quickly, the, the pedagog pedagogical benefits are students can concentrate on the performance, concentrate on the review later. They're better motivated because they know this, is, this now takes it out of the realm of something you do that cannot be reviewed and it's, it's hard for uh, people to really know what you're doing. And their reflective evaluations can be done out of class, preserving class time. Among, those are among some of the pedagogical benefits. Okay, uh, Professor Williams uh, is going to uh, show you his implementation of this. In uh, we'll take questions after his presentation because want to make sure we get everything out. Ready for a punch block here? <laughs> I'll just disconnect. This will be very short and sweet because it, the, the idea is just to give you an idea of, uh, of how it looks in one particular class. Uh, and, and just to give a little orientation, uh, when I was in the seventh grade, I wanted to play the trombone. And uh, we ordered a brand new trombone, and my folks took me down to the band room to pick it up, and the band instructor uh, gave me this beautiful trombone, and he opened it up, and it was shiny, and he said, here it is. You can take it home. You can open the case and look at it, but do not take it out. Do not put it together. Do not play with it. and uh, uh, Just leave it in the case until next Friday when you come back for your first class. So I took it home, took it out, put it together, and played with it for a week. And then, and then when I got to class the next Friday, I learned that it would take me several months to unlearn the bad habits that I had learned during that week, playing with my trombone, not knowing what I, uh, what I was doing. Uh, they say how not to learn tennis is to begin uh, just going out with a tennis racket and hammering away at the ball. Because if you then want to begin to learn tennis seriously, uh, your, uh, your tennis pro uh, takes a long, long time to help you unlearn all of the bad habits you learned uh, out there just hammering away at the ball and teaching you what the real stroke should be. The difficulty is that all of us first learn to negotiate the same way I learned to play the trombone and the same way uh, uh, amateurs all begin to, to, to learn tennis, and that is we do it in these ways. It's by trial and error, no formal instruction, no theoretical framework, no, no uh, foundational micro skills, inconsistent, inexpert feedback along the way, and of course, intermittent positive reinforcement. Because we all get to be pretty good uh, negotiators in many settings. That's where we get to in life. And so, obviously, it works like the slot machines in Las Vegas. Sometimes you win. And so you keep going back. Uh, but, but our sense is that there is a plateau effect. And, uh, and Larry, of course, is giving a much better uh, and more scholarly approach to the plateau effect. And so in teaching negotiation skills, uh, 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 my objectives have been, of course, to continue to offer good theory and then in light of what, uh, what Larry has just said, to add better learning theory, more specifically 
uh, deliberate practice, and I've got a handout that gives you a little uh, bit on it that we'll give uh, you can pick up if you uh, will uh, at the end, and then on reflective practice, which uh, both of which Larry has explained uh, very well and are referenced in the handout. Uh, with that theory, the idea is to give students more time practicing, to give them uh, to begin with micro skills so that, that the, the, normal, the normal way I've taught negotiation, I think most do it, is to give students an, a whole negotiation to do. And, and if you try to do the whole thing, then you really aren't, aren't focusing on small skills that can be developed and, per, uh, and perfected. It's like playing a whole golf game rather than practicing particular elements of golf. And so to begin with micro skills, to build from those foundational skills up to more complex, and then to use pervasive video recording uh, for feedback. And that, of course, is the keystone of our presentation today, is that pervasive video uh, recording. Uh, the idea in interviewing and counseling is to do all of the exercises in class and 40 cameras will more than do that because the class has, uh, has I think, uh, Larry, you limit yours to 24, uh, maybe a couple of sections of 24. Negotiation, I have always felt negotiation should be available to all comers. And so uh, my negotiation course last semester had 76 in it. And, and to teach a skills course to large, that large a number presents uh, some di uh, different challenges. So I have them do their negotiations outside of class, and we will have the, the uh, web cameras at the circulation desk of the law library. And so when it's time to record, well, first uh, week, students will go to the help desk. Uh, they'll get the, uh, the web uh, camera software installed. They'll also have the software installed for uploading the files onto our server. And then uh, when it comes time to do the negotiation, each student will check out a web camera from the law library, a very simple thing. Uh, they'll then uh, set it up with their notebook computer. We'll have them record at least 30 minutes of whatever they're doing for that exercise. They'll save the file uh, so they have a copy on their notebook. They'll upload the file so that uh, I'll have a copy and they'll have one there for future reference. Uh, they simply return the web camera to the circulation desk, and there will always be enough copies for enough web cameras for people to use because they'll have uh, three or four days in which uh, negotiations can be done. Uh, and then here are some photos that give you a little bit of idea of what it looks like. Uh, here is what the setup looks like. Here, these two are trying to stare each other down before they negotiate. Uh, <laughs> But notice that the camera on this side is actually pointing over there, and the camera over there is pointing to pick up this negotiator, and you see what he will see on his own screen. Um, a close-up of that is right here with him leaning forward. Uh, the negotiator on the other side has a screen that looks like this, because he's prepared a PowerPoint, which I cut off with my digital camera, but he's got all of the variables for the negotiation laid out, excuse me, in uh, Excel, so he can plug in uh, variables as he negotiates, and they're right there on his spreadsheet. So you can have both, he can have both his own image and, uh, and the spreadsheet uh, on the screen at the same time. Excuse me. Uh, And here's another shot as they, uh, as they work through the process and then believe it or not, in this case, they actually reached an agreement. So it's a very, very successful negotiation. Uh, now, the, uh, the student will always review the video on their own so that they, so that, uh, that they don't have to worry about remembering what they're doing while they're negotiating. They can then they can review it later to see what they did when they're negotiating. Excuse me, I keep hitting that. 
Uh, they then provide their own feedback by writing the, a structured reflective journal because they don't always know what to look for, but a structure for writing the reflective journal we found is very helpful. And then several times each semester, students will also meet with either me or with one of my TAs. Uh, we'll review their video together and uh, we'll give them constructive feedback as well. So that's the that's the basic uh, design. Uh, questions or comments about uh, about any of this? And I guess we'd be happy uh, both to take the questions. Okay. Qu yeah. The question is, if I have seventy-five five students, they all do a negotiation, and I review all of them. That's pretty time-consuming, and it's the and I review all of them that is the incorrect assumption. But the the nice thing here is they will all upload their negotiations onto the server. I will just review uh, some of them each week, but I'll know that they've all done them because they'll be on the server and they're knowing that I review some of them each week will help. I do the same thing with their journal installments, by the way. They, uh, they upload copies of their journal installments. I read uh, some of the journals each week, but not all of them. I tell them that. Every student assumes that I have read her journal uh, the preceding week. It's quite a wonderful mechanism, the way that works. I might, I might add to that, uh, if you find a pattern of Difficulty in, in a student, you you have you can now go back and selectively review that student's work, and and see if that pattern is continued, if there's a lack of motivation or some other thing. So, uh, uh, the students are doing their own analysis and reflecting on each exercise, and then periodically they get our feedback. And if we find a problem, we can focus on it. Please. Ah, yes, question. Are students allowed to watch other students' videos? And, and, and my sense is that that will be very importantly yes. So that as the semester progresses, when you're assigned to negotiate someone, you can really go and see that student in, the, in earlier negotiations and begin preparing for that individual. And in interviewing and counseling, you can go back. And I can point out here are three people that did very well on the exercise. You want to look at what they did, you can do that. That's correct. I'll be curious to see. I was just watching the way that they were interacting with their laptops in front of them. And prior to this, they wouldn't have had their laptops in a face to face negotiation. And so I'm wondering when it will be that they're not conscious of the images at all. They, they can actually push their laptops aside. These, these have a nine foot cable. And so. The, the, though, though I would say more than half of my students negotiate with their laptop in front of them because they've often done a spreadsheet uh, putting the variables on it or putting the facts on it. So, but but I, it, it does introduce a different. Yeah, they, that's right. Because they will be right there, and and it, it may be uh, that they'll find it distracting to have it. And as they move to tablet PCs, they'll always bring those because <laughs> they won't be distracted. <laughs> Please. Um, I, I believe actually in a mediation setting you could. Uh, uh, one camera do, is, is a little too narrow to get two negotiators because you can't comfortably sit face to face really close. But if you're on the same side of the table, like if, if we were, yeah, if two people are sitting on the same side of the table, one camera could pick them up. So we could have one camera over there picking us up, a camera here picking up two on the other side. But if you want a mediator at the end of the table, I think you would need a third camera. But since each one has, uh, has his or her, her own notebook, uh, that shouldn't be a problem. Now, was that responding to your question? Yeah, as would you see the two Oh, 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 yeah. The, We're uh, working on that. <laughs> the the, the uh, um, Adobe Premiere Pro, 
lets you take the two files and bring them in to uh, the, the two separate streams and bring them in and show them as one. And that, when I review with students, we're expecting that we're going to be able to show both negotiators at the same time on that stream. Yes. Please. There is, uh, there is Larry, a good literature. Larry, Larry. Oops, <laughs> forgot I had that on. Uh, in interviewing and counseling, yes, there's, uh, there's a very uh, nice chain of logic you can go through that, that establishes that. But principally it's because the, the lack of feedback uh, and the lack of theory for most lawyers and, the, and what they focus their attention on. And so, for example, most interviews are associative in nature, and they're substantive in nature. And it is a, a, an associative sequence that kind of bounces around and focuses on the substantive issues uh, for an untrained lawyer. And, uh, and that becomes a habit of mind and a habit of practice very quickly. And once you're into that habit, not much else changes in my observation. They're, they're guided by the same dynamics with each successive client, and the client doesn't anything, do anything to change that typically. Is it your expectation that having experienced these techniques in your course, that after they graduate, the students are going to be setting up with and No, no, that's, that's probably not the case. Uh, we, deliberate practice is something we, that's very useful in an educational setting. Very few people except, uh, you know, people engaged in performance activities, uh, Lawyers tend not to do that, not likely to do that, but they certainly can ref learn reflective skills and a reflective state of mind, which uh, is, is independently seen as a very useful professional orientation that results in improvement and growth over time. And so we teach reflection, we teach reflective skills, and, and they do it over and over again, and hopefully they learn some of that. Well, it, actually, I, I differ a little on that. My sense in those contexts very often is the student is failing as a counselor and that, that the, it is the ineffectiveness of the student as a counselor that leads to what, in fact, may be not a, a very effective decision by the client. And an effective counselor might get quite a different result and, 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 and maybe even a more creative and subtle decision or outcome for the client. There, so, yeah, go ahead. There's an interesting twist on this uh, for, for all of us as teachers. We, we've done the same research in the area of teacher rating, teacher evaluations. Now, not everybody has the same opinion about whether they're, well, we're, none of us are sure how helpful or unhelpful they are. But we have been astonished to discover that teacher evaluation ratings tend to, 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 to quickly establish themselves and remain constant throughout one's entire career, which would suggest that we are all also subject to the plateau effect. Yeah. We learn to get, we get good enough to, to, to survive in the classroom and we stay there. Now, it has been quite threatening to Larry and I to be doing all of this stuff on expertise and we've been prodding each other, Larry has been phenomenal at applying this to himself to improve his technique in the classroom because we would be quite hypocritical to be tell our students, you know, you've plateaued and not saying, well, we're plateauing also and, and to be driving ourselves. But I think we are subject ourselves as teachers as much to the plateau effect as, uh, as our students. Now what we get is a spiking effect. Some semesters you get it right and then you, <laughs> then you decide to, you know, let's try something new now 
and it spikes down. <laughs> and next, and I, hopefully over time, it's spiking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the progress in the. <laughs> Well, uh, I know of a bankruptcy practice where the partner records, uses a web camera to record all of the interviews with the, the paralegal for, uh, for uh, consistency and quality checks on wh uh, how, the, how the paralegals are performing. So, yeah, that, that, uh, in that practice, everything is recorded. And, and if the client wanted to sue, they probably would have great discovery in that case. <laughs> We, we do use the same software, uh, hardware and software. We think that's going to lead to uh, economies. Uh, for my evaluation, I have two TAs and myself, and at least twice per semester we sit down with the students for, for feedback purposes. We view the video with them and, and stop and, and talk about them, ask them what they're doing, what they had intended, what, and, and then try to give positive feedback as we go. So the, the videos, uh, in that sense, uh, are, are very, very useful. Logitech, it comes with the web camera. Uh, mine's a little different. I, uh, beginning this fall, I'm going to do every exercise in advance with two or three students. That will be posted on the same server. They, in some cases, I'll do it before the exercise, some cases after it. So they can download it as a model. They can download it for criticism, whatever they want to do with it, I guess. But, but that will reduce the amount of feedback I have to give because they will have seen my best performance with exactly the same exercise across a number of uh, legal problems. And, uh, and they can use that as a measure of, uh, for what I might say or, or do in that context. But I'll do something similar to what Jerry does as well. Okay, in the very back. Uh, for the whole package we're talking about, it's ten thousand dollars. Four thousand for one hundred twenty-nine dollars for each of those. Retail price. If you if we get forty of them, we're thinking we'll, it'll come in a little under a hundred dollars each. And the the. Uh, Actually, it may come in under that if we just have to buy the disk drives for the server. At one point, we thought we'd have to buy a whole server, but our technical people are telling us they've got a spare server. We can put these hard drives on. And, you, of course, you have to have the infrastructure that all of that plugs into. That's a good one. <laughs> well, we'll remember that. <laughs> that's a, uh, well, the, repeat the question, maybe. That's a good question. We have, uh, in the past, uh, had waivers so we can capture student performance and show them to future classes. But in this case, it isn't always the best performance, so good, good point. Yeah, the, well, the question, just so it gets on the webcast, was uh, are we going to have waivers so to have student permission to, to post these up so that other students can access them. And the, your second point was, are we going to have students commit not to download them and post these on the web? Because you could certainly do that, uh, post other students' things. I think that's a very nice question and point to raise. We'll, we'll cover that. The, uh, the material on the web is otherwise not accessible outside the class, but of course they can electronic thing distributed anywhere sure. in the world. Well, thank you. I would have a delightful time uh, together. If you've got, if you want to see the cameras, they're up here. Yeah, come and we'll see yourself. We've got minutes. it set up. <laughs> oh, yeah, the handouts are, are right.